believe I saw them. Bang! To three of us, two broken windows. Oh, God! Oh! commenced in Europe in 1939, it was realized that the American people had no intention of entering the war. But they believed that this country could be enticed into the war in very much the same way that it was enticed into the last one. They planned first to prepare the United States for foreign war under the guise of American defense. Second, to involve us in the war step by step without our realization. Third, to create a series of incidents which would force us into the actual conflict. These plans were, of course, to be covered and assisted by the full power of their propaganda. Our theaters soon became filled with plays portraying the glory of war. Newsreels lost all semblance of objectivity. And they have used the war to justify the restriction of congressional power and the assumption of dictatorial procedures on the part of the president and his appointees. A fear campaign was inaugurated. We cannot allow the natural passions and prejudices of other peoples to lead our country to destruction. the American Revolutionary War began as the American colonies sought to detach from England and its oppressive monarchy. Though many reasons are cited for the revolution, one in particular sticks out as the prime cause, that King George III of England outlawed the interest-free, independent currency the colonies were producing and using for themselves, in turn forcing them to borrow money from the Central Bank of England at interest, immediately putting the colonies into debt. And, as Benjamin Franklin later wrote, The refusal of King George III to allow the colonies to operate an honest money system which freed the ordinary man from the clutches of the money manipulators was probably the prime cause of the revolution. In 1783, America won its independence from England. However, its battle against the central bank concept and the corrupt, greed-filled men associated with it had just begun. So what is a central bank? A central bank is an institution that produces the currency of an entire nation. Based on historical precedent, two specific powers are inherent in central banking practice. The control of interest rates and the control of the money supply or inflation. The central bank does not simply supply a government's economy with money, it loans it to them at interest. Then through the use of increasing and decreasing the supply of money, the central bank regulates the value of the currency being issued. It is critical to understand that the entire structure of this system can only produce one thing in the long run. Debt. It doesn't take a lot of ingenuity to figure this scam out. For every single dollar produced by the central bank is loaned at interest. That means every single dollar produced is actually the dollar plus a certain percent of debt based on that dollar. And since the central bank has the monopoly of the production of the currency for the entire country, and they loan each dollar out with immediate debt attached to it, where does the money to pay for the debt come from? It can only come from the central bank again, which means the central bank has to perpetually increase its money supply to temporarily cover the outstanding debt created, which in turn, since that new money is loaned out at interest as well, 
creates even more debt. The end result of this system without fail is slavery, for it is impossible for the government and thus the public to ever come out of the self-generating debt. The founding fathers of this country were well aware of this. By the early 20th century, the U.S. had already implemented and removed a few central banking systems, which were swindled into place by ruthless banking interests. At this time, the dominant families in the banking and business world were the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Warburgs, the Rothschilds. And in the early 1900s, they sought to push, once again, legislation to create another central bank. However, they knew the government and public were very weary of such an institution, so they needed to create an incident to affect public opinion. So, J.P. Morgan, publicly considered a financial luminary at the time, exploited his mass influence by publishing rumors that a prominent bank in New York was insolvent or bankrupt. Morgan knew this would cause mass hysteria, which would affect other banks as well. And it did. The public, in fear of losing their deposits, immediately began mass withdrawals. Consequently, the banks were forced to call in their loans, causing the recipients to sell their property, and thus a spiral of bankruptcies, repossessions, and turmoil emerged. Putting the pieces together a few years later, Frederick Allen of Life magazine wrote, The Morgan interests took advantage to precipitate the panic, guiding it shrewdly as it progressed. Unaware of the fraud, the panic of 1907 led to a congressional investigation headed by Senator Nelson Aldrich, who had intimate ties to the banking cartels and later became part of the Rockefeller family through marriage. The commission, led by Aldrich, recommended a central bank should be implemented so a panic like 1907 could never happen again. This was the spark the international bankers needed to initiate their plan. In 1910, a secret meeting was held at a J.P. Morgan estate on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. It was there that the central banking bill called the Federal Reserve Act was written. This legislation was written by bankers, not lawmakers. This meeting was so secretive, so concealed from government and public knowledge, that the ten or so figures who attended disguised their names when en route to the island. After this bill was constructed, it was then handed over to their political frontman, Senator Nelson Aldrich, to push through Congress. And in 1913, with heavy political sponsorship by the bankers, Woodrow Wilson became president, having already agreed to sign the Federal Reserve Act in exchange for campaign support. And two days before Christmas, when most of Congress was at home with their families, the Federal Reserve Act was voted in, and Wilson in turn made it law. Later, Woodrow Wilson wrote, in regret, Congressman Lewis McFadden also expressed the truth after the passage of the bill. A world banking system was being set up here, a super state controlled by international bankers acting together to enslave the world for their own pleasure. The Fed has usurped the government. Now, the public was told that the Federal Reserve System was an economic stabilizer, and inflation and economic crises were a thing of the past. Well, as history has shown, nothing is further from the truth. The fact is, the international bankers now had a streamlined machine to expand their personal ambitions. It's alive, it's alive, it's alive. For example, from 1914 to 1919, the Fed increased the money supply by nearly 100%, resulting in extensive loans to small banks and the public. Then, in 1920, the Fed called in mass percentages of the outstanding money supply, thus resulting in the supporting banks having to call in huge numbers of loans, and, just like 1907, bank runs, bankruptcy, and collapse occurred. 
over 5,400 competitive banks outside of the Federal Reserve System collapsed, further consolidating the monopoly of a small group of international bankers. Privy to this crime, Congressman Lindbergh stepped up and said in 1921, under the Federal Reserve Act, panics are scientifically created. The present panic is the first scientifically created one, worked out as we figure a mathematical equation. However, the panic of 1920 was just a warm-up. From 1921 to 1929, the Fed again increased the money supply, resulting once again in extensive loans to the public and banks. There was also a fairly new type of loan called a margin loan in the stock market. Very simply, the margin loan allowed an investor to put down only 10% of a stock's price, with the other 90% being loaned through the broker. In other words, a person could own $1,000 worth of stock with only $100 down. This method was very popular in the roaring 1920s, as everyone seemed to be making money in the market. However, there was a catch to this loan. It could be called in at any time and had to be paid within 24 hours. This is termed a margin call, and the typical result of a margin call is the selling of the stock purchased with the loan. So, a few months before October in 1929, J.D. Rockefeller, Bernard Barak, and other insiders quietly exited the market. And on October 24, 1929, the New York financiers who furnished the margin loans started calling them in in mass. This sparked an instantaneous, massive sell-off in the market, for everyone had to cover the margin loans. It then triggered mass bank runs for the same reason, in turn collapsing over 16,000 banks, enabling the conspiring international bankers to not only buy up rival banks at a discount, but to also buy up whole corporations at pennies on the dollar. It was the greatest robbery in American history. But that didn't stop there. Rather than expanding the money supply in order to recover from this economic collapse, the Fed actually contracted it, fueling one of the largest depressions in history. Once again outraged, Congressman Lewis McFadden, a longtime opponent of the banking cartels, began bringing impeachment proceedings against the Federal Reserve Board, saying of the crash and depression, it was a carefully contrived occurrence. International bankers sought to bring about a condition of despair so that they might emerge the rulers of us all. Not surprisingly, and after two previous assassination attempts, McFadden was poisoned at a banquet before he could push for the impeachment. Now, having reduced the society to squalor, the Federal Reserve bankers decided that the gold standard should be removed. In order to do this, they needed to acquire the remaining gold in the system. So, under the pretense of helping to end the depression, came the 1933 gold seizure. Under the threat of imprisonment for 10 years, everyone in America was required to turn in all gold bullion to the treasury, essentially robbing the public of what little wealth they had left. And at the end of 1933, the gold standard was abolished. If you look at a dollar bill from before 1933, it says it is redeemable in gold. If you look at a dollar bill today, it says it is legal tender, which means it is backed by absolutely nothing. It is worthless paper. The only thing that gives our money value is how much of it is in circulation. Therefore, the power to regulate the money supply is also the power to regulate its value, which is also the power to bring entire economies and societies to its knees. It's important to clearly understand, the Federal Reserve is a private corporation. It is about as federal as Federal Express. It makes its own policies and is under virtually no regulation by the U.S. government. It is a private bank that loans all the currency at interest to the government, completely consistent with the fraudulent central banking model that the country sought to escape from when it declared independence in the American Revolutionary War. Now, going back to 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was not the only unconstitutional bill pushed through Congress. They also pushed the federal income tax. It's worthwhile to point out that the American public's ignorance towards the federal income tax is a testament to how dumbed down and oblivious the American population really is. First of all, the federal income tax is completely unconstitutional, as it is a direct, unapportioned tax. All direct taxes have to be apportioned to be legal based on the Constitution. Secondly, the required number of states in order to ratify the amendment to allow the income tax was never met, and this has even been cited in modern court cases. Third, at the present day, roughly 25% of the average worker's income is taken via this tax. And guess where that money goes? It goes to pay the interest on the currency being produced by the fraudulent Federal Reserve Bank, a system that does not have to exist at all. 
The money you make working almost three months out of the year goes almost literally into the pockets of the international bankers who own the private Federal Reserve.